and you know my my district is in the western slope of Colorado we we go all the way to the border with Utah um 60 percent of the district are public lands uh, that includes national forest uh, BLM and we also have ranching we have oil and gas uh, industry so the environment is so important for people in our state for people in in our communities and Latinos we have been kept out of the environmentalist movement of the environmentalist uh, decision making for too long and you know I, I saw that firsthand uh, when I was advocating for against the expansion of a mind in in our communities and the people that I was talking to were telling me well there's this fancy neighborhood there and these people are is this is going to impact their views this is going to impact uh, their quality of life and I said what about all the the middle school and the elementary school and the river that's right there and the the air quality water quality this is going to impact our people heavily and we are not part of the conversation <laughs> we are not um you know we're not being heard they're they're not including us in 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 the movement you know it was very focused on listening to the experts of the uh the geologists <laughs> and of course, we need to lead with science and with facts, but we also have our lived experience. We have um, firsthand experiences that are affecting our communities. So, you know, one of the, um, we also had a major fire that shut down I-70 for two weeks. And at that time, it was in 2020, we had the worst air quality in the world here in Colorado because of the smoke that was coming from the mega fires out in California and in Oregon. So, you know, at, at that time with this mega fire, we didn't have information in our language. We didn't have information in Spanish. Uh, this is about evacuation orders. These are life and death decisions that our community needs to have access to. And, and we didn't. So I was volunteering and advocating for language access. And I participated with uh, and helped with, with the incident management teams, uh, saw the collaboration and saw how it's all hands on deck whenever there's an emergency. But we are seeing uh, the impacts of climate change that are uh, impacting us heavily in our rural communities, affecting our access to clean water, to clean air, um, even to open roads, <laughs> you know, now, now with the, the fire scar in, in our community, we have landslides. Uh, we had a major landslide that took out a, a deck of I-70, a major roadway and vein of access for us to products and to services, um, and also affected our, our, our economy, uh, as a tourist community. So, you know, this is why I was an environment. I am an environmentalist, uh, and I I am proud to serve in the Energy and Environment Committee, proud to serve in the Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Water Committee, because I am there to make sure that our voices are heard, that we have environmental justice included in these bills, that as we look to a future of clean energy that we are included, that we are not being left behind as we have been. Thank you so much for that. And as you were talking, a lot of things spoke to me, more so the, the understanding of accessibility. If we have both English and Spanish resources where we are able to educate all of our community members, but also that we're all part of the community. It's not only at the political level, every community member as a stakeholder in every concern that constitutes their communities and damage to environmental resources and water and all of that, uh, but more so understanding that also youth, our youth is a priority for all of us and having equity at all the levels and that our youth are able to enjoy clean water and clean air. It also ties back 
the conservation of our natural resources to health. If we don't have a uh, healthy, if we're not healthy, if our oceans and our waters are not um, at its best, if they're contaminated, if everything is polluted, then what type of access and what type of life are we actually having? And can all of us benefit from having those clean and polluted, non-polluted spaces? So I think you spoke to all of that while you were um, talking. Representative Velasco, so I thank you for that and, and for advocating for all of us and putting, putting Latines at the forefront of the conversation because we're at times seen as underrepresented minorities, but we are a majority in a lot of spaces. So understanding that is also able to allow us to move and advocate more. Um, and you were kind of already starting the conversation of some of the movements you've done in the water and equity justice. Can you tell us and change, uh, kind of share some more on the other efforts that you are currently working on in Colorado um, in the water justice sphere as well? Yes, I am, I am working on a, a bill <clears throat> that's going to be introduced soon this week uh, around water quality for mobile home parks. In, in the state, we have over 800 mobile home parks, and in my district, we have th over 300. <clears throat> so I, I grew up in, in mobile home parks. Um, I, I know that this is an industry where um, these millionaires come, billionaires come and buy up corporate uh, businesses, buy up the, the mobile home park, they increase the rent, make their profit and then sell. And then the next buyer comes, buys the, the mobile home park, increases the rent and sells. So the money never is invested back in the community. So we have aging infrastructure, um, we have uh, um, communities that have bad water quality. Um, I I remember my my past uh, job was in interpreting and translating, uh, and I did that for over ten years and with fighting for language access. But I was interpreting for a meeting with public health in a rural community, and these the the public health <laughs> officers were explaining how this water pass. EPA regulations, and this water was bright red, coming from a well, um, and they the the community members were explaining this this water stains my clothes, breaks my appliances, makes my kids sick, and you're telling me that this is clean, <laughs> and you're telling me that this is safe, um, so we um, we recognize that this is an issue across the state and that the waterways uh, and where the water sources have not been identified, that the protocols for water testing um, are not enough, that the regulations are not enough, that uh, our kids and, and our community members are not able to have clean water, and that at the, at the national level, uh, you know, these, these regulations say that color, odor, and taste are secondary, uh, regulations, which is not acceptable. <laughs> I mean, it's not acceptable uh, to ask us or, uh, you know, majority Latino residents in majority people of color residents in, in, in communities um, that depend on our work and depend on our labor to thrive. Um, and these are also pockets of, of affordable housing, um, you know, that, that in a lot of ways uh, support the economy and support the tourist industry and the resort industry and and to tell us that we don't have the right to clean water uh, it's really unacceptable so we are bringing this legislation to start that work to push the state to do better and to serve everyone and not leave us behind um, but also in in my uh, committees of, of reference, you know, like energy and environment and, and agriculture. I see many bills that come through where I'm able to support uh, access to clean water. For example, we had um, a bill that regulates the usage of water in oil and gas operations, you know, which it really in our community, 
um, as we see that this industry is is part of of our economy, that oh, this is not affecting disproportionately impacted communities, uh, that our schools are not being closed because of leaks um, from this fracking water. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot that that we that we must do at the state level. Uh, to pass more legislation like this, you know, to protect our communities and safeguard our, ch our children um, so that we all have access to, to clean water. Thank you so much for sharing and also acknowledging and appreciate all your efforts you're doing at the forefront in Colorado for all of those communities that deserve, deserve clean water, deserve clean air, deserve a space that they could go out and breathe and go to school and go to work and don't have to think about other things at the back end or suffering from asthma, just thinking that from going to school, they have that on the back end. They should just enjoy life. You should just have accessibility at all times So everything. So acknowledging that Representative Velasco, you're undergoing all of those things to be able to support our communities over there. It makes us really happy and we're rooting for you and, and everything that you're doing. And I know you'll do many other things, but we also acknowledge that you have uh, limited time with us today. And before closing your space, I wanted to ask you if there's anything else you wanna share with our community members hearing us today um, and any closing remarks on your end. Yes, thank you so much. I I want to to share, you know, that that all voices are needed at all the levels, uh, from the grassroots to the grass tops, and that your voice matters, your lived experience matters. That uh, you know, jump in, jump in into the water, and and we are here to hold you. You know, do we uh, run for office? Uh, you are prepared. You are ready. You are qualified. Um, and yeah, that, you know, we need your votes, we need uh, your advocacy, your leadership, and that that's needed um, at the local level and the national level and the state level. And and this is, uh, your lived experiences are unique and, and you bring so much. So um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to share. And thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you for joining us. And I hope those, um, Closing remarks are able to grasp all of your hearts and acknowledgement that we all matter at all levels and any advocacy on your end. If you're shy because you think you're not enough or you're not at a state of politics or or anything at the local level at your house, you every day matters like every voice matters. So grasp from that, acknowledge that and move forward in the efforts of supporting of communities. Um, and now we thank you so much for Representative Velasco. We'll transition the conversation over to Beatriz Soto and a little bit about her before she's able to enlighten us in a little presentation acknowledging every effort that she's currently doing in Colorado. Beatriz Soto has been at the intersection of community building social justice and working towards a stable climate for the past two decades. It's a long time, Beatriz. Uh, everything that you've done is amazing. She's an award-winning architect with a LEED certification. She's worked on a variety of sustainable and high-performance projects. She's also developed and led professional workforce development workshops in the U.S. and Mexico for a variety of nonprofits in the building and energy-efficient sectors. She's a former director of Defiende Nuestra Tierra for the Wilderness Workshops, co-founding members of Voces Unidas de las Montañas, and is currently director of Protegete, a statewide initiative from Conservation Colorado, who has the mission to elevate Latinos, Latina communities, solutions to protecting our lands, waters, air, and fight for environmental and climate justice. Beatriz, te cedo el espacio. I open the space up to you and we're looking forward to everything you have to enlighten us with today. Gracias, buenos dias, good morning everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I just wanna say thank you to the Hispanic Access Foundation for all the amazing work you do and um, for Latino Advocacy Week. We much gratitude for all the work that you guys are doing at a national level 
and also share that Rep Velasco makes my piel chinita. She makes me so happy. She's my representative. And, I, you know, we, I know we're not talking politics, but it takes a village, right, to represent um, electeds like her and make sure that, you know, she wins, she's sustained when she's in power. So it's such an honor to, to see her and, and now be working with her as an elected official. Um, so that's that's why it's so important electing, right, the people that we know that are going to that are going to work with us. I'm going to share um, a, a quick presentation about some of the work that Protegete is doing in Colorado. So everybody, please bear with me and then we can open it up for a little bit of conversation. And all of this is going to kind of just build on what Rep Representative Velasco was talking about. Um, and I also want to share that this idea actually came from the Hispanic Access. You guys do such amazing reports on collecting information at a national level about the state of Latinos, our opinions, how we're doing. And um, I know it's hard to go very granular, but this is really what inspired Protegete to do something similar at a smaller scale and complement what the Hispanic Access Foundation is doing at a national scale and just get more information driven by Latinos asking the questions and hopefully finding the solutions that will really impact our communities in, in the long term. So I'm going to just kind of dive in a little bit of, of the process that we did. So what we asked is, where are the Latinos in Colorado? And we needed to come up with a metric to, you know, compare high Latino counties and low Latino counties and just compare a whole bunch of environmental questions that we had. Where are the most EVs and solar panels? Where have the decades of resources and rebates that have been passed, you know, even through the Obama area? Are they going to Latino counties, right? Are they? So what we really did is Colorado is 20% Latino, and we looked at all the communities that were 25% Latino or more, and we qualified those as high Latino counties. We didn't just go after populations, right? Because we know Denver, for example, is the largest urban area in Colorado, and there's a lot of Latinos there, there's big numbers. But there's unique circumstances when we have a lot of Latino community, a disproportionately amount of Latino community, and then even if it's just the numbers aren't huge, yet how power is shared and who has a voice, and when we have communities that have high percentages of Latinos, this is where we really start to see how the environment and health kind of overlays with, with those communities. So here's a graphic, for example, of population, right? We can see that Adams and Denver um, County have a lot of population, but not necessarily the higher proportions of Latinos. And then we can also start to see how, how does the environment look in these areas? How does water quality look? Where is the land pollution? Where is the air pollution? Where are the air monitors, right? Where are our public lands and parks and all this infrastructure that helps us thrive and survive and, and be resilient? So we really wanted to take a deep dive into what does it look like in the state of Colorado? So basically, um, this, this map shows in blue all the Latino counties that are 25 to 50% Latino. Um, and then when we look at the light blue, um, those are above 50% Latino. Um, and then in pink, we kind of showed the communities that we considered isolated, right? It's, it's harder for them to build power with their neighboring communities and it's harder, the infrastructure. And what we found actually is that in Colorado, 50% of Latinos are actually in rural communities. They're not necessarily in the cities, right? And there's certain areas in Colorado, like Colorado Springs, and then the northern part of Colorado, that is growing 200% faster than the US average of Latino growth. So we also have pockets in Colorado that are growing really, really fast in terms of Latino population. And the Latino community in Colorado is at the percentage level that it was in eight, the 1870s when Colorado became a state and became a part of the United States. So for a really long period of time, Latinos had not been at that percentage of power in the state of Colorado. And we know a lot of this, everything from being removed from their land um, and the treaty that the Guadalupe Hidalgo and a lot of Latinos being deported, we're finally getting back to the representation of Colorado when it used to be um, actually part of Mexico, right? 
Um, obviously, that other part of the population was indigenous communities, and we recognize and work pretty closely with tribal communities as well, um, the youth specifically, to make sure that the numbers of representation aren't solely Latino, but also um, from indigenous communities as well. So then when we start to look at, you know, where is the climate pollution in Colorado? So basically, we've started to identify where all the oil and gas is happening in our state. And I'll connect all of this to water in a little bit. But all you see in pink here is really where oil and gas is denser. And you can see how once you see it in a map, there's no way you cannot see that it's high in Latino counties. Um, and it's disproportionately impacting Latino counties specifically. Um, and this is just, it's just starking. This map just, I can't, every time I look at it, it just, it surprises me how much more oil and gas is in, is in our communities. We also, once we jump into water, we also ask the question of, you know, where are the impaired riverways in Colorado, which means that they have more pollutants and they have more contamination. And then we were also looking in terms of flooding. We also know that with climate change, our communities are going to see more flooding. Certain communities might see more flooding. Other communities might see more wildfires. Other communities are going to see drought, right? So we wanted to make sure that we understood where these regions were. And then how does that overlap with Latino communities and how does that overlap with how we talk about these issues? So we don't assume that the Latinos in Colorado are a monolith because we are not. We are urban. We are rural. We are also, you know, there's Latino families here that have been here for 10, 12 generations before um, Colorado was part of the United States. But then we also have a lot of Latino communities from that have been migrating from Puerto Rico, that have been migrating from Central America and Mexico. And there's just so much diversity of Latinos that when we go and organize with our communities, we want to make sure that we're talking about the issues that are relevant to them and their specific region of the state. Um, and this is why doing research like this, I feel, is like so important. And we obviously want to complement the national narrative and the national information and conversation. Something that we found going back to oil and gas and water is that the high Latino counties in Colorado are 30% of the counties in Colorado. And 44% of all the domestic groundwater is actually in Latino counties, in high Latino counties. So the majority of um, the, the well water is coming from these communities, but then this is where oil and gas is also located. So what we're finding is that there are 10 oil and gas um, operation or drilling for every seven miles in a Latino community. Versus in a white affluent community, we only see, you know, five oil and gas operations for 10 miles and they have one well. So we're seeing more well concentration, more oil and gas concentration in high Latino counties. And why is this important? Because wells aren't regulated the same way as public water sources. So if Latinos, the majority of Latinos are drinking their water from, um, from wells with less regulation, that puts our whole community in another like sphere of water quality. And as Elizabeth Velasco, Representative Velasco mentioned, we were also looking at housing, right? And trying to understand how does housing look like in Colorado as well? And what we found is that one in every five households, 20% of households are mobile homes. So it's, it's a huge disproportion of numbers, right? And um, the people in Colorado that live in mobile home um, parks are majority veterans, um, communities that have some sort of disability, um, aging communities, and Latino communities. It's very much, you can see that some of the communities that are the most disproportionately impacted are in mobile home parks. They're in rural communities. They're closer to oil and gas. They're on wells. And adding all this factor that Representative Velasco was talking about, these corporate interests coming in and buying these communities and not being a part of the community and not really caring about their health 
are just making this situation worse for this specific type of housing. But kind of beyond just mobile homes, it's like it's it's really a big concern how much our community depends on well water. And we also know that well water, we've heard a lot of um, because of drought, we've heard a lot of stories in Colorado of wells going dry um, and being very temporary and a lot of our community not having access to water for long periods of time and starting to become more and more common in the state of Colorado. Then when we look at water violations in terms of not meeting the EPA regulations in Colorado, 88% of all water violations are in high Latino counties. That is ridiculous. And we're seeing that, that again, this is, remember guys, this is only 20% of the population and how is it possible that the majority of water violations, and this is all public information, right? All of this information we found through um, the Colorado Health and Environment um, Agency and the EPA information as well. And basically what we did is we overlapped it with high Latino counties to figure out where all of this is because nobody ever presents the information to us just like, just like that, looking at our community specifically. What we're also finding is when we go back to um, groundwater, um, approximately, you know, you have 20 wells per brownfield in the state of Colorado and high Latino counties. And then when you go to low Latino counties where the proportion of Latinos is lower than the state average, we only see 12. So I know we hear this narrative across the country, but I think it's really important to look in your state exactly how it looks. And then that way we have more tools to advocate for our communities and then pass state legislation, right? Because we know that complements the federal legislation and with all the investments that are coming through the IRA and the infrastructure bill, we want to make sure that our community is advocating for those funds to go to their communities and solve some of these long lasting historic um, issues that have really been impacting our communities. So I'm going to stop sharing um, and just open it up for conversation, but I just kind of wanted to kick us off a little bit with some of the work that Protegete um, did this past year and obviously this is a resource for the Hispanic Access Foundation and for all of you and again we're we're here to complement each other's work. Beatriz that was a very impactful presentation um, and at the same time I appreciate that you took the time to basically as we would say in Puerto Rico in arroz de habichuelas and rice and beans kind of explain to our communities what the data is saying, because at times um, some people don't think about everything we're going through until the data basically validates what we see at the forefront of our communities. So having that and having been able to have you to provide to our community what is happening at the forefront in Colorado is amazing. And we appreciate you took the time and space to kind of let us know all those facts and kind of understand more as you were going through the slides of how disproportionate is the impact, how the environmental racism context is happening, because there is a disproportionate um, impact in the land space, in the use, in the contamination and pollution, the spaces, the housing, um, everything goes into play and indirectly Things like health are also part of the equation when you think about the contamination of waters, air pollution, the oils and wells, and how we have more at, at the forefront of our communities in comparison of other wealthier communities. Um, and all of that goes into play. So thank you so much for, for showing all of that. And I also wanted to maybe provide a space for you to talk a little bit more because I know um, Protegete has been able to do other toolkits available, but also bilingual. So you have toolkits in English and Spanish for our community to better understand some of those things that are happening, but you also have them. Can you share a little bit more of what you've been doing in this um, process of developing such toolkits? Yeah, so this is um, the, the one I 
presented is the Colorado Climate Justice Policy Handbook. Again, thank you so much for the Hispanic Access Foundation and your leadership kind of pulling, putting these toolkits together at a, at a national level. That was truly an inspiration um, for, for our work. But another really important thing that we've been doing is the Colorado Latino Policy Agenda. That is a partnership with a reproductive justice and health justice organization led by Latinos Color. Um, and then with uh, Voces Unidas de las Montañas, which is a nonprofit as well that focuses on Latinos. And all three of us came together to start doing some pretty impressive polling in the state of Colorado. Um, we started with 800 people in 2021, and by 2022, we've been polling um, close to 1,500. And this poll really is intersectional, and this is where we prioritize um, how we prioritize policy at the state level. So with the information from data and then the public sentiment specifically about kind of taking the pulse on community to see what's really firing them up and what they really care about really has been a formula in Colorado to help us figure out what the policy priorities for groups that focus on Latinos and that really care are intersectional are really thinking about what is the policy that our community will support and that they see themselves reflected in in policy solutions because we don't want to go out there and you know decide for community what's best for them we want to hear from community and the way that we've been doing the polling is making sure that we're not just polling denver this tends to happen a lot because it's the easiest place to poll it actually takes more money resources time translation to pull outside of that denver area so we've been very intentional of only keeping a third of the numbers coming from Denver and then identifying those different communities and contrasting them, right? What does this community feel? Why is it different than the southern part of the state? Why is it different from the western part of the state? And then how, what are the unique um, information that we're finding from different parts of, of the state? But for example, in, in some of the polling that we've we found is that the water issue in mobile home parks. And that's why we decided to support um, Representative Velasco and help craft those ideas as to what needs to happen. Because when we polled in our last polling, we found that one in every three Latinos in Colorado does not trust or drink their water. That is 30% of Latinos in the state of Colorado do not trust or drink their water. And once we started looking at people that live in mobile home parks, Latinos that live in mobile home parks, that number went up to 40%. So that's a really big number. And then we also asked our community, are you, does, does this matter to you? Do you support passing stricter regulation and providing clean water to mobile home parks owners? And we found a staggering 82% of Latinos, even if they don't live in mobile home parks, they want to see their neighbors that do live in these communities have access to clean water. So we're not only, you know, going out there and getting the data, we're also being really intentional of asking community through listening sessions and through very robust polling, what are the top priorities? So this really at least gives me and Protegete a lot of confidence that the policy that we're working on are actually priorities for, for Latino communities. We also asked questions around um, development. Housing is getting very expensive in Colorado. I'm pretty sure this is happening across the nation, but community is in favor of, you know, more density. They wanna build up, they don't wanna build out, which is really important, right? Because we know we're in a biodiversity laws. We know that we need to protect our ecosystems and we know that building denser, closer to public transportation, um, not sprawling, which tends to be what happens in Colorado, depending more on vehicles and hurting our natural resources by being denser. We had huge support for that. Um, and then we also asked, you know, does the Latino community want to focus on addressing drought? And 90% of Latinos in the state of Colorado um, want us to see fighting for um, drought policy to ensure that the Colorado River continues to have water. We're a state, a head state, a water head state. So it's really important and it's part of the Latino values in the state of Colorado. 
And again, it just gives us the reassurance that we're heading in the right direction and that this is a top priority for our community and making sure that we are sharing this information far and wide with the policymakers because they tend to care about how the community feels about these issues. And, and again, um, the Hispanic Access Foundation has been such a great leader in showing how to do this right. And um, we're hoping to um, follow a similar model in your leadership to make sure that we're asking those questions and putting that information out there. Thank you so much, Beatriz. And I know Shana, our conservation director, might be on her end ecstatic with seeing and hearing you um, and understanding that you found that we are kind of um, in the forefront as well as you are in, in leading those type of of effort. So a big shout out to Shauna um, and her, the conservation team that has done amazing work um, in being able to support our underrepresented communities and, and being able to have the data, have the translations and have resources to better accommodate and serve all of them. Um, and I know you've talked about various ways of basically creating accessibility, but I'm wondering if for everyone viewing us today and every other leader in their nonprofit and in their respective communities as well, any other things that you can think of that we can do to secure and basically have accessibility for our communities as it pertains to water justice, water equity, and environmental equity. I know you've done the data. I, I know many things are at the forefront right now. Any other ways that we could do it at a local level, at a state level, at a national level that you found um, resourceful? You know, I'm 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 gonna piggyback a little bit on um, what Representative Velasco got us kind of started on. Um, our lived experience is so important. Um, a lot of times we don't give value because we think we need to be an expert, and we had to have a PhD or a master's degree to be able to advocate for what we're seeing every single day in our community with our abuelitas, the comadre tells us at the quinceañera what's happening at our neighborhood. I mean, honestly, this, this, um, the work that we're doing in mobile home parks started with a group of women that said, you know, I have a son that has autism and he's starting to get rashes on his body. And a, a, a friend of ours was telling us that her hair was falling off from the water that was coming out of her tap. These are not complicated spaces. This, these are community spaces where community is telling us what's happening. And I think there's a real urgency, um, not just to address these issues and advocate for our legislators, but it's honestly time for us to step up and lead. When we look at the water basins and the water boards in Colorado, these are the same type of people that have been in these positions of Hour for over a century. When we look at um, zone planning and zoning, when we look at our city councils and we look at our county commissions, we look at our state rep uh, representatives and, and the Senate, we're seeing disproportionate amount of Latino leadership. Be our voice is not at the table. I think it's really time for us to take matters into our hands. And when we say stand in your power goes beyond advocating, but signing up for a leadership position. We are needed more than ever. And it's up to us to make sure that we are not only putting the information out there, but we are standing up to lead in these places. And we have a whole community behind us. And I think that's where it's not only, you know, uh, water crisis, a climate crisis. Come on, let's be honest, it's a leadership crisis. We need the leaders, we need people from our community that we can speak to that will welcome us, that we can invite in for a cafecito at our home and that we know our legislator cares about us deeply and that needs to come from our community as well. And we need to put forward leaders that are willing to step into these positions of power a lot of these boards are voluntary. A lot of them are not necessarily paid, but we definitely need to make sure that part of our civic engagement and part of our 
work with democracy is co-leading, right? And signing up for these positions and taking on these roles. Because if it weren't an emergency and if we weren't in a crisis, maybe we can just stand back a little bit and let others lead. And, and, and I know we all suffer imposter syndrome. It's really hard to be in these spaces, but the time is now and the moment is now as we've seen slow action from, unfortunately, a lot of times from our governments, local governments, national governments, and we constantly as Latino, we pull the highest in terms of favoring conservation. We pull the highest in terms of addressing pollution and addressing drought. Yet when you look at the numbers, we're the lowest in positions of leadership. So again, I just want to emphasize that I just don't believe this is just a water crisis and a climate crisis. Is it? It's a leadership crisis. And our leadership is needed more than ever. Latino leadership and all these decision-making bodies are needed more than ever. So I just encourage everybody in this group to really look around your community. And even if it's a smaller board, let's start stepping into these positions of power. Let's, let's start helping um, asking our comadres and our good friends to run for office and to start to see themselves as leaders. Um, but yeah, that's, I guess, my um, how I really want to just emphasize how much our leadership is needed more than ever. Powerful message, I would say, um, to some what you've said. And um, I do believe that at times it might be imposter syndrome, it might be other things, but that all of that does not impede us from moving forward and, and taking those um, places, taking those positions and actually being there, basically bridging our communities. If they see us, if they see themselves reflective, I, I agree, like you've said, Beatriz, um, it'll be easier for all of us to be able to better bridge and community and support each other. And because we're at a 50 minute mark, I wanted to open the space to our community. Anybody that is here with us today with any questions uh, for Beatriz, we would be more than happy to share them with her and have them answer. So I'll maybe do a quick one minute space for you all to drop any questions on the chat or any others that uh, the members of Hispanic Access have um, to be able to be answered by Beatriz. And I'll quickly transferring over to the chat section to see any concerns, any comments, any questions that our community wants to ask or provide for Beatriz. Oh, we have a question, Beatriz. Uh, this one comes from David. David, how can leaders of color work together without either stepping on each other's toes, egos, versus cannibalizing and pushing each other out of power, for example, positions of responsibility? Thank you, David. Um, you know, I think this really takes a lot of um, community work to build trust and relationships. We know one of the tools of white supremacy is to put people of color against each other. Um, and this has historically worked really well in the United States, um, where the African American community, indigenous communities, Latino communities, and then the Latino community too, right? The migrant community versus community that have been here for, for many, many centuries tend to be fighting against each other. And I think it's really time to kind of do a lot of um, decolonializing work right internally and you know each of us doing our due diligence of work that needs to happen but then also doing it in community and having those honest and harsh conversations to, to put put forward and, and I don't think it's going to be easy right but it really takes a paradigm shift and 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 a different thought because we are the system is designed to make us do that it's designed to make us fight against each other it's it's very much rooted in scarcity and la madre tierra nos da todos everything we need, right? Everything is out there. Um, but again, when you have this very capitalist system as well, where the, the strongest is, is, is the, the one that takes all and in our community, you know, let's, let's also go back to our roots. We are in, in our indigenous roots, right? Where we're very much a community of solidarity, working together, thinking about the collective, 
and feeding more on that those parts of our heritage while yes part of our heritage is also being you know very colonial and but we also get an opportunity to choose right we get an opportunity to choose as to what we gravitate towards and and what what we grow and and what we water right if 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 we grow um and we practice scarcity and competition and ego and replicating these systems of oppression that's what we're going to get really good at right we're going to become experts in that but if we look at our own communities and how our resilience is tied to solidarity um, working together helping each other out being collective i mean during COVID, I saw Latino communities come out and work together like never before to make sure that we were gonna, you know, survive and that our community was getting our due um, share of resources and access to information. It's like, that's in our culture. I think it's just a matter of, again, just echando la agüita every day to that solicito every single day to that part of our, you know, our identities and feeding that and letting that flourish and, um aligning our values with each other and and you know being honest and and i know there's going to be a lot of hard conversations amongst our own communities i've seen a lot of differences between the black community in denver and the latino community in denver and it, it takes work but um sometimes they say you have to move slow to move fast i think we have to be very intentional about recognizing that in our communities and then kind of embracing the collective parts of our of our cultures as well and, and and feeding into that that's that's always optional right we get to shape the culture um and just not allowing you know white supremacy to continue to divide us that's not a straightforward answer <laughs> it's, it's it's a hard question thank you David. <laughs> yeah and through Healing has difficult conversations. Unlearning and learning uh, engages in difficult conversations. Um, as we move forward to a stage of acknowledgement, of recognizing and, and embracing those new conversations, those new spaces, those new transitions, um, a lot of this is generational. It's what we've known is what has been instilled because of past and and present um even experiences but as we do that healing as we do that transition and basically elevate bridge and unite our communities um it goes and and eventually it's more fluid that that engagement and that recognition so thank you beatrice um and any other questions from our community members. I have many on my end, but I want to make sure that I provide a space for our community members if they have any other questions uh, for Beatriz. And as we have more questions, David is also saying, Beatriz, we need to talk and discuss damages in order to not forget. Um, great points. Thank you, David, for sharing. And I also know, uh, Beatriz, uh, through learning from the organization you're working with, um, better understanding that you want to set yourself at the forefront to uh, basically not piloting, but leading efforts in environmental justice, equity, and all of those fears. Um, for other states that are trying to get there, for other states that do not even know how to start, but are facing some of the similar um, concerns, the similar problems, underrepresented communities not being visible, not being heard, um, what would you say to them and how would you um, help them from the back end in supporting their future endeavors in increasing in moving and in advocating and becoming leaders in the environmental justice movement. We are more than happy to really share, you know, kind of a little bit of the, how we figured out the formula for the policy handbook. Um, we really use the census track information. And again, a lot of this information is public information, it's just not presented in a way that centers Latinos. Um, so it makes it really hard to find the information. Um, 
So I'm, I'm more than happy to just kind of share how we structured our team, the questions that we asked ourselves that we wanted to find some answers towards. So that's, again, I'm, I'm and I'll put my email in the in the chat as well. So anybody, please feel free to, to reach out. Um, there's a lot of groups doing some amazing polling around the, the country. I think that's really important for us to continue to be part of that conversation. And then Protegete is also working on leadership development for boards and commissions and for youth as well, some programming. And our intention is to make it an open source um, because we know no one organization can cover <laughs> um, the whole state, even the whole state, right? We're a state-based organization. So the way that we've really been thinking about it is how do we make everything we do open sourced? Because when we talk about um, how to impact and combat climate change, we always think about scale and we think about, you know, how do you make it easy for others to replicate? Because if others can't do it, then you're hoarding the information, you're hoarding the knowledge, and we're not about that, right? So something that we've also been really thinking about is how do we make sure that all our leadership trainings and all the foundation of the work that we're doing is, is open source and anybody can use it, and going back to the beats point is like, how do we get out of that cannibalizing and that competition and stop doing that and say, hey, I have this resource, whoever needs it, wants it, take it, make it your own. How can I help you go do this in your community? And we build a bigger movement because we know at the end of the tunnel, there's going to be more resources for all of us um, once we figure this all out. So um, something that I see from a lot of, um, you know, black and brown women that I like to read, um, I, I choose to read them more is, you know, sitting well with uncertainty and then also living today the life that we envision for tomorrow. So how can I live today the life that I see, you know, my great great grandchildren living and what can I start to do today to make that a possibility? And one thing is just like leaving away a lot of bad habits, right? And again, open sourcing everything we do so we have more impact and we have better collaborations. And whoever I know I'm going to give whatever information to, they're going to take it and make it better. And that's that's the point, right, of how do we scale the, um, our efforts up. And our biggest resource that we have as a Latino community is our culture, is our connections. We might not be the wealthiest community, but we are a lot of community in, 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 our, in this country, and we have an impact that's going to go all the way through all our continent because we belong in every single part of our continent so how do we scale that up even beyond the united states to mexico to brazil to centro america to make sure that all the work that we're doing is interconnecting and we're breaking down some of these models and that we're scaling up our connectivity and our solidaridad um, to make sure that we're supporting each other um, and making sure that the latino community beyond borders is resilient and is able to adapt to a new climate. What spoke to me about that is the interconnectedness in the in what we do, but also interconnectedness in providing um, solutions that think about everything. Um, I think at a past, we thought all solutions would only come from one side, um, now understanding that even on getting to know and, and provide solution making processes for climate change and everything entails a sum of a lot of people, a lot of members at a local, state, national, from scientists to leaders in, at the forefront of communities. Um, everybody has a play and a role in providing spaces for those solutions to be accessible and providing spaces like you said, Beatriz, where you are providing resources open source um, with a lot of bilingual opportunities within the resources. So community members that do not speak English are able to have them accessible, but also providing and bridging other communities, other nonprofits, other stakeholders in conversation that might not have the resources, but you provide as a space as well to unite, work together and provide other ways um, to this. And I also saw you were able to put your 
email on the chat. So thank you for that. And I want to um, reiterate something that we said. The problem is that we've been taught acculturated into a zero sum game tragedy of the commons. Um, so how do we get past that and have a different way of going over? And I want to respect everyone's space and time and convening and understanding that here in Tampa is 11.59 EST. So thank you so much, Beatriz. Thank you so much for Hispanic Access. Um, and I am Jashira Valentin, a program associate for the Mono Project and here on behalf of Hispanic Access Foundation. But at the back end, we also have an amazing team government affairs, we have conservation, we have our mono project, we have our communications, we have our alumni members and everyone, the Alejandra providing translation. Uh, there's a big community at the back end providing spaces all throughout the week for Latino Advocacy Week. So um, be able to visualize events at a hybrid mode, but also there are a lot of events happening in person in Washington DC, so stick and be able to let us know if you found this webinar informational, if anything spoke to you, let us know on the chat. And we're hoping to see you all throughout the week with many other webinars and events. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beatriz. And have a great day, everyone. Gracias.